Okay. Um, why don't we just go ahead and try to do the example A, chapter, section 3 6. But maybe there are some questions about the homework that's due today or that's going to be due next week. Somebody, at least one person, got ahead and started to think about the homework that's due next week. Oh man, I was thinking that's so bad. That is scary. <laughs> that is scary. Okay. So most people will only want to think about that next Tuesday. Anybody else have any thoughts? What about the homework? I guess homework due today is. It was fun. It was fun. You like getting part of it? is how much of these notes you're able to get through or comprehend. Are there any questions about them? Or is it just too much material? I have notes, I have the, the lecture, and we have the class. Is that too much stuff? Do you want to say I do have that. If you need any back notes, I've got plenty of them. They're just sitting in piles at home. Just these things, I think. Okay. Well, notes are good because, you know, for us, or at least for my simple mind, you know, repetition works. So I see it in class, I can rewatch it on the video, I have the notes. Okay, it works well. So you have an extra resource. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then, uh, let's just jump in then and try this uh, section 3 6. I think we're, we did the Bayesian thing. Let's go on to the next page. We're about page 96 in the book as far as we've lecture. Uh, okay, so I went through the, the methods last time in which I discussed one of the, the main methods we're going to use. I don't think I discussed during density method, but, I, but the discussion here is uh, transformation of a pair, I'll see, distribution of the sum. Z equals X plus Y when the joint density FX Y is given. Okay. So little FX Y is the joint density of random variables X and Y. And we came up with a formula for what the joint for the joint for the density of Z is. Last time we showed that the formula for the density of Z is the following. is integral minus infinity to infinity f of x, z minus x, dx. That's the general formula for the density of Z in this situation. That's the formula second from the bottom on page 97. He doesn't give it a number. He doesn't say, give much fanfare about it or anything. independent, that's a big if, if they're independent, then this formula takes a special uh, form, okay, if independent, call this star, if x and y are independent, then f of x, y will be equal to the product of the marginal density. We have some sense of the home at this point because we've been doing a little bit of marginal densities and so on. And star becomes something uh, more a little difficult. So integral, uh, you get f sub z. A little z equals integral minus infinity to infinity f of f sub x of x times f sub y of z minus x. That's called the convolution integral. All right. All right. 
but that's only in the case when x and y are independent. May I apply that in a more special formula? So let's try example 3.6.1a, top of page 98. Let's just go through it a little bit so that. Given a joint density as follows, let's just go ahead and apply the formula and see how it works. f of xy is equal to lambda squared e to the minus lambda y for zero less or equal to x less or equal to y. Okay, and y greater than zero. Okay, and zero else. That's a joint density. Uh, we might verify that it is a joint density. Uh, isn't that the right one? No, no I'm sorry, what are you doing? Oh, that's your homework. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> you confused me by bringing this in. Okay, so fxy is going to be, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take x and y independent exponential. Is that what I have? Yeah. Yeah, all right. So here it is. So x and y are independent exponential random variables. And so let's compute the density of the sum. So actually, it does make sense that I'm starting to write down that other density. That is your homework problem. It's a nastier density, but you have to use this formula here. The difficulty is not, this formula is not difficult. It's why get in. The difficulty is in setting the limits right. So let's see how that works. In your problem, no, no, exponential random variables, each with parameter lambda. So let's just see how this goes. So f sub x, f of xy, therefore, is, is the product case. So this is f sub x of x f sub y of y equals lambda e to the minus lambda x, lambda e to the minus lambda y, x and y greater than zero. And zero else. So now if I go ahead and plug in star, therefore, f sub z of z is an interval. All right? I guess I can plug it in from this double star. Um, well, the thing is, that once I start putting these functions in, I can't put the interval minus infinity with any. So I'm just going to put in some integral, right? Mm -hmm. Some integral. So let's fix it, figure out what the limits are at the end. So <coughs> lambda e to the minus lambda x, that's the easy part. That's just x of x. Okay? Then s of y at z minus x. So then I put the lambda e to the minus lambda, put the z minus x in. I have a dx. But what are the limits? K0 to z. How do you know that? Well, they're independent. X and y are greater than zero. So okay, so I'm going to say y is greater than zero. All right, so let's have a look at it. How do you get that? What you need is that this, since y must be greater than zero, then this must be greater than zero. You get the condition z minus x greater than zero. And you also get this condition that uh, x is greater than zero. Okay? So those, uh, so those two conditions, because of the density, x and y greater than zero. So y is z minus x here. So let's see, so that becomes, this This gives you x lesser than equal to z, and this gives you x greater than equal to zero. You get, uh, you get two inequalities, x less than or equal to z, and x greater than or equal to zero. So that gives you x goes from 0 to z. Okay. Is everybody kind of following this now? And outside of this interval, you're just integrating 0. In other words, the product of these two densities is 0. I mean, the product of these two expressions is 0. 
outside this interval of x from 0 to z. If x is bigger than z, for example, then this, ex this expression is 0 because then you have f sub y at a negative number. If x is less than 0, then this one is negative. This, then the entry into this expression is 0. This expression is 0 because the entry into the density is negative. All right. So then that becomes an easy integral, right? Actually, it's not very easy because you get e to the minus lambda times the minus x here and gives you a plus x. So this part of the exponential cancels this. All right? And so you're simply getting lambda squared e to the minus lambda z. X, x goes from 0 to z, so there's nothing to integrate. So you get lambda squared. E to, I pull the e to the minus lambda z out. Then I have integral 0 to z dx. So you simply get z, lambda squared z, e to the minus lambda z. And that's for z greater than 0, obviously. Um, z must be greater than 0, x and y are greater than 0. You see, if it's not bigger than 0, then of course. And the, the, the condition was that z also had to be bigger than 0 because z was greater than x. All right. <clears throat> what kind of density is that, by the way? Anybody recognize it? All right. If it didn't have the z, or it didn't have the extra power of lambda, it would be exponential, right? What other density has the exponential and its prefactors of powers? Normal? No. Gamma. The gamma as is some constant in front that has powers of z, e to the minus lambda z, or powers of t, e to the minus lambda t. So that's a gamma density. Uh, the parameters are, let's see, what is the gamma density again? Uh, the gamma density is something like this. It was uh, lambda to the alpha, t to the alpha minus 1, e to the minus lambda t over gamma alpha. Right, so the gamma alpha is some constant. Basically, you're getting one less power of t than you have powers of lambda, and then you have one less lambda t like that. So, in particular, when alpha is one, you get the you get the uh, the exponential when alpha is one. And here you have alpha equals two. So this is gamma with the shape parameter to alpha. Shape parameter. Alpha equals 2, and it's getting parameter lambda. <coughs> lambda. I think we talked about scaling parameter before. Okay. All right, now actually, this can be extended if I, uh, if I actually take two independent gammas and get another gamma. I think I did that in the notes. Um, See what I've got here? Two exponentials are two independent gammas with alpha equal 1. Alpha equal 1 and alpha equal 1. Right. Or uh, alpha equal 1 and beta equal 1. If you want to have two independent alphas, one with parameter alpha and lambda, the other with parameter beta and lambda. Am I talking gibberish now? I'm going to go back now. What have you got? What I'm trying to point out is that there's a more general result. In other words, if I put two gamma densities in here, independent case, as long as they have the same scaling parameters, so there's the same lambda in here, then I get a gamma coming out with the sum of the alphas. 1 plus 1 equals 2. Alpha plus 3 equals alpha plus beta. Okay. So I do that. So in fact, gamma of parameter, uh, if you put an n here, okay, what you get is that is the, if you put an n there, all right, like that, then this is the distribution of the sum of n, in, the sum of n independent exponentials.
that would follow because if I could get the sum of the first two exponentials to be uh, gamma 2, and if I know then I, th let's say a third one, third exponential, well gamma 2 plus gamma 1 will give me gamma 3. Right? Why this comment that I make? That I didn't write it down. So sum, so general, uh, more general, I'll write it down. Sum of independent gamma, alpha, lambda, and gamma, beta, lambda, is gamma, alpha plus beta, lambda. Okay. Where I'm putting the shape parameter first and the scaling parameter second. is kind of easy. Powers is, see what would happen. You'd get z to the alpha minus 1, you'd get, oh, uh, okay. Okay, then it's not so obvious, because then you get a z minus x to the bay minus 1. <laughs> you guys should go through it. I did this in the notes. You don't probably want to go through that hell. Okay. do this, let's prove this last statement. Yeah, let's call this uh, triple star. Okay. Okay. So prove triple star. Or any, uh, so this time you're going to have f sub the sum, you're going to have z equals x plus y. So this time you're going to have f sub z of z equals integral. It's going to be the same argument, 0 to z. Okay. Now it's going to be lambda to the alpha minus 1. It's going to be lambda to the alpha, z to the alpha minus 1. It's going to be x. x to the alpha minus 1. I'll put these gamma alpha down here. You're going to have lambda to the beta, z minus x to the beta minus 1. You're going to have the e to the minus lambda x, you're going to have the e to the minus lambda z minus x. It's the same exact argument, dx. Except you have a little bit nastier looking thing because the z minus x to the beta minus 1 comes in, the x to the alpha minus 1 comes in, you have higher power than lambda. Okay. So what's going to happen? The exponential part is still going to cancel. And you're just going to drag everything else outside. You're going to have lambda to the alpha plus beta, e to the minus lambda z. And then you're going to have, you're going to have a gamma alpha, gamma beta downstairs. And then you're going to have the integral now, which is a little bit harder than before. x to the alpha minus 1, z minus x to the beta minus 1. What you notice now, almost, <laughs> if you're guessing that you should get gamma out, then try to follow that, right? This all looks good, e to the minus lambda z. Now, do I get a power of z coming out of this? How do I get a power of z coming out of this integral? Is that just a power of z times a constant? The whole thing with this game is the constants have to take care of themselves. This will be a probability density. In other words, when I get a function of z in the end, as a function of z, it will integrate to 1. I guess I'm a half line from z goes from 0 to infinity. Okay. So, you kind of, when you're sort of looking at this, you kind of forget about all the constants for a minute to say, what's the form of the function of z? z to the minus lambda z times whatever whatever comes out of this integral. Now, what is that integral? We have a, a gamma. 
Yeah, there will be some stuff coming out. Okay, let's just finish it. But I'm right at this point, I'm just trying to teach you how you might think about this. So, I'm, and I'm guessing gamma. So I'm guessing a power of z. Is, this is just going to be a power of z times a constant, this integral. The z is the parameter. It's fixed. X is the integration variable. Is it possible that just a power of z would come out of this? Go with my guess. Okay, so don't worry, Mara giving this guess. But anyway, just go with this guess. All right. What? That's what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove triple star. So actually, I know a power of z should come out. The power of z that should come out is alpha plus beta minus one, because that's what it says. It should be n minus one is the power. Okay. So what substitution will I make to transform this integral into something nice? I think I'll go. Uh, I think I just make. Uh, you see, it's it's the form of this beta. Yeah, zero to one. So. So that means uh, u equals zx. I'm using x equals zu. Or z theta is what you'd rather, okay? Because that was the uh, thing you had in the binomial in the uh, theta. So what happens then is that uh, x to the alpha minus 1 becomes z to the alpha minus 1, which is a constant now for our purpose, because z is a fixed number. In this computation, I'm thinking of it as the variable at the end, but for this computation, it's fixed. <coughs> x to the alpha minus 1, z minus x to the beta minus 1 is equal to z. I'll just get the z to the beta minus 1, and then I'll get 1 minus theta. Is that x to the alpha minus 1? dx is z d beta. And that's where the other z comes from. Because you see you have z alpha minus 1, z beta minus 1, but here's the other z. Alpha plus beta minus 1. And so then you simply get this integral becomes so if I get this whole business becomes I'll carry this other stuff out. Lambda the alpha plus beta. E to the minus lambda z. I have my gamma alpha, gamma beta. And then I have integral 0 to 1. I um, I, I get to the alpha plus beta minus 1, theta to the alpha minus 1, 1 minus theta to the beta minus 1, d to theta. Okay, so this, this, this is just a constant relative to this integration, so I pull that out. So yes, I am getting the gamma density. So this is now proved. You say, well, wait a second. Question. You don't have the right constant. Right? Gamma alpha, gamma beta is not the same thing as gamma alpha plus beta. All right? So how does that work out? I have a question. How did you get that one on top for the limits? Oh, uh, x, okay, I didn't do that either then. Okay. So x goes from 0 to z, so therefore beta goes from x over, I mean 0 over z to z over z, right? I'm just, just changing the limits. I'm going to do my definite integral. I always do, whenever I make a change of variables, I always go to the new variable and change the limits. <clears throat> so, 0 to 1. That's how I chose it. I thought, yeah, you wanted to go from 0 to 1. That was exactly the right thing to do. That means I have to have x go from 0 to z, so I have to that's right, so put x over z equals the thing. Oh, okay. okay? Okay, so what's the point of all of this? I guess the whole point of this is that um, the constants must check. And I think the last thing that I wanted to do is to check the constant. That's why I did this thing, besides going through the computation again. I know what the constant for the gamma is. This is gamma of n is defined so that this integral comes out to be 1. That's actually the definition of the gamma function. All right? But now, so I know, since I'm getting a density, that the constant associated with this whole business, which is 
these two, the product of these two numbers, and then whatever this integral from zero to one of theta to alpha minus one minus theta to beta minus one to theta is, that's just a number in alpha and beta. It's just some function of alpha and beta, some constant of alpha and beta, right? This part is just some constant dependent on alpha and beta. So what is that constant? So I know that that constant divided by gamma alpha, gamma beta has to equal one over gamma alpha plus beta. So I get lambda alpha plus beta z to the alpha plus beta minus one e to the minus lambda z over times c alpha beta over gamma alpha gamma beta. And therefore, c alpha beta over gamma alpha gamma beta. So is equal to one over gamma of alpha plus beta. Because this is a gamma. Uh, we're guaranteed to get a density out of this. Right? So guaranteed to get a density. And therefore, whatever this constant evaluates to, it's got to be like this. And therefore, what I'm getting is that I'm actually evaluating this integral. That's the beta integral, the beta density. So it gives me the right normalization for the beta density. Remember we said that this was just a beta density once upon a time way back in chapter two? In some little paragraph, we discussed that last time. Ah, blah is a beta density. But where do you get the right normalization? Well, here's one way you can do it. You can actually calculate this integral now by doing this. So I think that part is, it should be at least a little intriguing, okay? Therefore, I'm hoping, okay? Therefore, integral zero to one, theta to the alpha minus one, one minus theta to the beta minus one, e theta, is equal to, okay, so C alpha, so it's the gamma alpha, the gamma beta, or gamma of alpha plus beta. That is equivalent to the statement that, um, F of theta equals gamma of alpha plus beta over gamma alpha, gamma beta, theta to the alpha minus one, one minus theta to the beta minus one, zero less than theta less than one, is a density, is a, what we call beta density. Okay. With parameters alpha and beta. So I have to flip the constant. This integral is equal to that. So if I flip the constant, multiply it, from, you know, multiply it in front of the density, then I get one, which is the total integral of the density. Okay. All right. So I guess I've wasted my breath and all that, but um, I thought it was a cute observation. Yeah. How did you get c to the alpha plus beta minus one? Because okay. I have alpha. Minus, minus one, one plus beta minus one plus this one. Oh, the dx is c d theta. One. Okay. Yeah. See why it helps to actually know what you're supposed to be getting in order to put all the pieces together. It's easy for me because I've done it many times. But so there is where I kind of since I'm, the guess is helping uh -huh. me, you know, see the pieces of the puzzle. substitute for this one. I get one z from here, beta minus one z is from here, and alpha minus one z is from here. Okay. Let's go on then, maybe. Uh, so you should be kind of familiar now with gammas and betas. Um, I've done the rest of these notes essentially. I've note six. So I think we're ready to go on. I didn't do I, I skipped so far I skipped everything about the bivariate normal. I'll come back and get it. Get it later, I love believe. Because it is a long computation. And you didn't have any problems on it. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> When we get to real statistics, you'll, you'll want to know about it.
now we're doing a whole lot of probability calculus, way more than you ever would have thought of doing in Math 381. Okay, because we don't make people do all these change of variables and stuff. <coughs> That's nasty. Okay, so let's go on to discuss. Um, well, there I should comment about Proposition A, page 102, before we leave this section. That is the um, a density method, a general density method. Which I was trying to illustrate after time had already expired last time. <laughs> I think now it's not probably the tape had gone dead. <laughs> no, it hadn't. Okay. Um, What is the the um, the density method? That is, if if uh, if I wanted to, uh, this formula turns out for the density of the sum of two random variables. Actually, it was obtained by the distribution function method. We derived it that way. We did not use the density function. There are two methods which I was trying to outline last time. So this is the density function method. CDF or PDF? PDF. The probability density function. Okay? There's a CDF, which is the cumulative distribution function, and there's the PDF, which is the probability density function. The little f and the capital F, right? for calculating the joint density, calculating the density of, of u equals g of x and y, some transformation g. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. The problem is this. I need two transformations in order to use the density method. <laughs> it's not enough just to take one, because what I'm going to do is I want to transform a joint density, fxy, into an, another joint density, okay, fuv. That's the natural thing to do. Because remember, before, let's do the little sketch. What I had was I mapped, uh, maybe I was just transforming one variable x to g of x. Okay. And so I had some curve here, and I had dots on the x-axis. And then I passed them to the hourglass, and I got dots on the g of x-axis. Okay. And I talked about the density of g of x by putting little bins here, talking about how many dots were in this bin is equal to the number of dots in this little bin over here. And so then I got a probability equation, f sub x of x dx, which is the probability of a dot falling in here, the percentage of dots falling in that little bin, equal to, if I call this u equals g of x, equals f sub u of u du. Okay? Where this width of this, oops. Okay, this was not a process thing like this. Okay, where this width of this, little interval here, okay, try to make it, was corresponding to, somehow to the slope of this curve, all right? But that's still infinitesimal, okay? So the number of dots was preserved. So the percentage of the dots were preserved for to get this equal to that. So these things were equal, equal quantities, equal infinitesimal quantities. So the two-dimensional two version of this is somehow, I have to say, when I, have, have, I think about it this way, when I take a pair of random variables, x and y, I'm getting dots in the plane. Now what am I going to do with those dots? Well, I can't like get rid of them. I have to like, transform them to another plane, right? Okay. 
So it's a two-variable transformation. We're calculating the joint density of this and V. I have to introduce, if I'm only interested in, let's say, the sum, for example, which is all I did before, equals x plus y, I have to actually introduce an auxiliary transformation, V, real transformation, V equals h of x, y, in order to get a joint density. And then I can get the, the density that I want to do by taking the marginal. That's the method. Yeah. It's longer. <laughs> so you have to introduce an auxiliary variable. And the, but the, the idea is exactly the same. F sub u v now of the joint density of the transform variable times times the area times the uh, <coughs> down right times d a. What happens is when you transform now a little, little rectangle in x y space. Now I'm going to take x and y. And that's going to go over to u and v space. So now I have my dots in the plane, the good old dots in the plane, you know, because I have random pairs, the age and the height of a person or something, okay? For each person you get a dot, okay? Then you get those dots over here after the transformation, okay? Now a little rectangle here, you might say, okay, that's going to, but that's not going to go to a rectangle necessarily, not nonlinear transformation, or even a linear one, it might be a parallelogram. Okay, so in the small, actually, it is a parallelogram. Well, let's call in, so in the test, we'll just call this area, this is dx and this is dy over here, and this is at area dA, okay? Then what you get, f u v u v dA equals f sub x y, x y, d x dy, okay? okay? That's the probability equation. Exactly mirroring this one. And then what is, uh, what happens is dA and, this, and so on. What happened before, when I actually did the one variable case, I put the du on the other side, and I get a dx du. Okay? Which is like uh, the reciprocal of the slope. Reciprocal of the slope of u over x. Okay? Now, this DA has to do with uh, Jacobian, okay? Well, that's not like that. Anyway, I'll just say it. F U V U V is therefore equal to uh, F X Y. So this is the statement of proposition A now. Y, then you get the part, you get the uh, determinant D X Y. Value, where this dxy dv is the Jacobian, which is the determinant of the matrix of partial derivatives. Why the Jacobian? Because that's how it works. The dA is a determinant. Remember how area comes out as a determinant? You don't remember that? <laughs> okay. In linear algebra, okay. If I'm taking, if I got two little vectors like this, make a little parallelogram, okay, put those as two column vectors, the area of the parallelogram is the determinant of the, of the thing. So if I have this is, this is the column vector A, B, and this is the column vector C, D, okay, then the area here is the determinant of A, B, C, D. Together, they figure which matrix is to determine it. Maybe they didn't have the value or whatever. If I got the orientation wrong. Okay? So that's why the determinant comes in. So where this is, uh, he calls it capital J, right, in the book. So this is, where this is D, X, Y by D.
So actually, usually the way it's done is that this is then written as fxy, xy, because the, the um, is that this thing is actually the reciprocal of the one where you differentiate the other way. And maybe I shouldn't get into that. That's Cal 3 kind of stuff. Okay, so I think this is the way I wrote it before. Okay, so if you actually have a forward transformation, you have to take the reciprocal of the slope, so to speak. Alright. So that's proposition A. So actually you can use that. Um, the computations are starting to get long now. I gave an example in the handout. So, was, so there is a direct method uh, using joint density. So I just want to point this out that it's kind of involved in general. Find simply the density of u equals g of x and y. I have to introduce a second transformation doesn't have any meaning at all, per se. It just makes it the problem easy. And then I get this out. For example, I could apply this method for example, uh, apply the density method to recover the distribution function method we already obtained to uh, u equals x plus y. Okay. And then I'll take v equals x minus y. Okay. That's a very, and then just do that. And then I have a, uh, a transformation from the plane to the plane. Then I have f of uv, uv, equals f sub xy, xy. Then I'm going to take 1 over this, this uh, absolute value of the Jacobian, duv, dxy. What is the Jacobian? That's 1 over uh, the determinant of, uh, let's see, it's du, and I have to put this, it's du d x, dv dx, du dy, V D Y like that. Okay. So that's that term. It comes out to be one over. This turns out these deter these derivatives are very simple, right? What's the U D X? That's one. The U D Y is one. The U D X the V D X is one. The V D Y is minus one. So I get one over one 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 minus one absolute value here. That's one over the absolute value of minus two equals one half. Is a one half. And so I get f u v so u and v is equal to then I'll solve for x and y in terms of u and v. That's what you have to do here. Where x is x of u and v, y is y of u and v. I'll slow down for a second. This is just going to be given, so I'm not going to actually say what f of x and y is. I'm just going to leave it there. Right? So now I'm going to plug in though u, the x in terms of u. How could you get x in terms of u and v? Let's see, add these. That gives you u plus v divided by 2, right? Now subtract them, u minus v over 2. So I'll give you the y. Okay, times a half. Okay, so that's the joint density of u and v. Now, how would I just get the density of u? That's what I wanted before. I wrote down some integral formula for it before, right? How would I get the joint, how would I get the density of u? Well, I would just find the marginal density. That's the method I would mentioned that before, so without, you would, you would have just said, okay, he said something about marginal, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that, I forgot it, but now I'm actually going to use it, okay, I'm actually going to find the density now of u by integrating out the v, that's how you do it, then you find f sub u of u 
equals integral of minus infinity to infinity f of u plus v over 2, u minus v over 2, d v. And it was times a half, right? Now, is that going to come out to the same formula I had before for the density of the sum? It doesn't look quite the same, does it? I'm going back a page in my notes here. I actually did this on the bottom of page 3, note 6. There it is. So how do I actually get this thing out? I'm going to make a change of variables. U is fixed here. U is fixed. And then I'm going to take, in terms of, and then I'm going to change V, I'm going to put DX. I'm going to put x equals to u plus v over 2. So I want that to be the x. x equals u plus v over 2. And then what does that make u minus v over 2? u is fixed. So u minus v over 2 would be um, x minus v. Right? What? Or u minus x. That's the way I want it. So u minus x. u minus v over 2. That's the only hard part here. At this point, u minus x. This is the way I'm going to define x. Okay, okay define x is this variable. U, u is fixed, and then v is my variable. Okay? So dx is dv over 2. Okay? And now I can plug in. Still, uh, x is still going from minus infinity to infinity because v was going from minus infinity to infinity. X goes from minus infinity to infinity. Minus infinity over 2 to infinity over 2. Okay? U is not going to affect the infinity. So, you get then that this integral becomes integral minus infinity to infinity f of x comma u minus x dx dv over 2 being half the, the one half going into the dv over 2. Okay? And so I'm done. That's exactly what we had before. F sub u of u. So I derived with this density method the same formula we had before. This is the only formula I really want you to know or use. <laughs> I just want you to illustrate that these other things exist. There are plenty of examples worked out in the book about finding, let's say, the the density of a product or quotient or um, some other weird function, right, of x and y, right? A product or quotient as a function of two variables, right? x over y or x times y. You have to introduce an auxiliary variable in general. That's the general method. <coughs> Play this game with the Jacobian. Integrate out the other variable. So I didn't actually do an explicit, explicit example. I did a general, in which case it's a general sum by this application. Okay, I think that, that's probably enough. You can look to the notes if you want some more. <laughs> There's more. Okay. Well, we'll skip the rest. Okay. So all these integrals flying around, you see? A lot of integration. Lots of change of variables. Yeah, change of variables. Isn't it great? <laughs> Two variables, one variable. What variable are you talking about, variable? <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> so let's skip this the rest of this now. We we'll go on to the next section. We have about 20 minutes. Let's have a look at that so we can get a little head start on the homework over the weekend. Um, we're only going to get through probably the first couple of pages of these number seven, but that's all right. So let's talk about order statistics. This is something that at first is kind of confusing. Um, but after a couple of examples, you start to see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let now instead of just two random variables, I'm going to take n independent random variables. <clears throat> independent. So 
this is getting closer to real statistics. Independent uh, random variables, each with the density f of x. So I actually can write the joint densities as the product of the marginal densities. It'll be a so if you want, you could write f joint density would be f x1 through xn equals f x1 times f of x2 times and so on times f xn. So it could be joint density. Well, x1 through xn. So you can actually write it down. It's just a product. This is really bad usage, the f on the same side, because that's not that's a function of n variables. That's a function of one variable. So if you want to not be so bad, you put the subscript here to make it actually a different name. Okay. <laughs> Then it makes it ugly. So, <laughs> make your pick. That's simply what we're going to do. And now, what we're going to do is we're going to define x of 1, parenthesis 1, is the minimum of x1 through xn. That's just, if I have n numbers, it's just the smallest one among them. Okay? Mean this one. Minimum. Minimum number. If I have uh, numbers 2, minus 5, 7, 17, 33, the smallest number is minus 5. Okay, so if I have. If I, if, what did I say? I have no idea what I said. Okay. <laughs> if I have these four numbers, uh -huh. that's the minimum. <laughs> X, can we think of X X as in a series or a sequence? A sequence. Yeah. Sequence. Let's take the X maximum. XMN is max. X of N is the max. Okay. So what I'm gonna in general what I'm gonna do is then I'm gonna also or define all the order statistics. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sort the data X1 and I'm gonna call the lowest number X parenthesis one, the second lowest number X of parenthesis two. And the highest one. If I have a continuous random variable, then ties are going to be impossible. Uh, the chance that x1 equals x2, or any two that actually equal, will be zero. So. Would we do this with continuous as well? Yeah, this is the continuous case. It is. With density here, we'll assume. Okay, so we're assuming that these x1, x2, dot dot, xn are just real numbers. Real numbers, any real number in the whole continuous plane, or just continuous line? Yeah, continuous line. Yeah. So I'm just taking n numbers in continuous line, pick at random somehow, and I'll sort them. And then at least two sets of numbers because you're in the continuous case. Well, you'll never get two equals. Right? So you just sort them, and then, as you know, though, sorting is a non-trivial process. I didn't write a sorting routine or anything like that. Okay. I mean, it takes a fair amount of computation to actually sort a list of numbers. So, what's going to happen is the independent structure is going to be totally destroyed. These random variables are not independent. This is the one dimension. So this is actually a, this is a transformation actually the minimum when you take the you actually take the minimum of two numbers that's a, that's like a product or the quotient or anything like that it's just it's another function okay so the, your question was um, are you talking about like a n dimensional or not is it just yeah well the the, the, the n tuple is n dimensional yes it is. So we've kind of gone on to say, oh, let's talk about n-dimensional uh, case. So you, you 
have to write the, the joint density would be the real value of the function of n real variables. And you have to, if you took the sample and represented it by a dot, it would be in n dimensions. Okay? You have n coordinates, right? The age, height, weight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, of somebody. Okay? So your height, you know, statistics has to do with high dimensions. You know, that geometry usually. I can't think of it. You can't think of more than two dimensions or three dimensions, right? So, so anyway, those, that's how the, those are the so-called order statistics. And uh, let's have a look at them. Let's have a 3.7 example A. That's probably the key example. Let T1. So just to get this one example, you can introduce this general general terminology. But T1, T2, and so on up to Tn be independent exponential random variables. Each with parameter lambda. And actually, these could be now the lifetimes of components. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a system of components. Now, a component is just going to be a little circle. Okay, and you can think of these as electrical components or whatever. And sometimes the engineers put them in parallel, sometimes they put them in series because they have to, not because they want to. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and so on. And so let's pretend we have them in series because we have to, okay? So let's take n components in series. Each, and somehow they have similarities and they have the same type of lifetimes, the same parameter. So n components in series. All right, electrical engineers will have a lot more intuition about this than me. But anyway, we can make this little picture. And so this one has a certain lifetime. This one has a certain lifetime. This one has a certain lifetime. What's the lifetime of the system? The smallest. Yeah, the minimum time to survive. So the survival time of, of the system is just the survival time, the least survival time, right? The, the uh, weakest link in the chain, right? So, so the T1 equals the minimum of T1 through Tn is the life, is the system lifetime in this case. What do you think the system lifetime is for parallel system components? Maximum. Maximum, very good. Okay, so what's the, um, let's find the density of the system lifetime. What's the density of T sub 1 like that? This is a series system. Okay. I didn't write everything on the board, but that's our assumption that we have a series system. Okay. What's the density? I'm going to go back to the tried and true distribution function method, this density method with all that U, F, U, V, and so on. I have to integrate a whole bunch of stuff out. I don't want to do all that. So I'm going to go back to the distribution function method. That was the most basic one. So let's look at the, uh, the first, the distribution, the CDF. Yep. This is the PDF of a random variable. I don't, instead, I'm going to go to the CDF and then differentiate the CDF. All right. CDF distribution function method. Is F sub capital T, I had to do double subscripts here because of my strange definition, notation, but I'll just, all T, okay, is equal to the probability that capital, the minimum is less or equal to T. But, 
easier way to get this is as follows. This is one of the tricks. We talk about survival time, survival of the system, right? Well, what's the survival probability? One minus. Yeah. This is one minus the probability that capital T sub one is bigger than T. This is the probability of surviving the time T. Okay, this is the survival probability. What's the probability in terms of the individual components that the system survives? The system survives to time T. System survival probability, right? System survival probability is this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, how can I write that in terms of the individual components? They're independent. They're independent. One minus. Okay. Yeah, okay, so you have to define, but the point is, what is the event that the system survives through time to? N choose one time. Okay, let's not go to formulas yet, but all right. Maybe go to formulas. Yeah, there's some formula in the book. Okay. Well, I want to get, I want to derive this without the formula in the book. This is the event that the system survives through time t. Mm -hmm. How can that happen in terms of individual components? Describe that in terms of individual the system survives to time t, meets each every one survives to time t, mm -hmm. right? It has to be. Mm -hmm. In fact, the minimum bigger than t, if and only if every one bigger than t. All right? If one of them was less than t, then the minimum is not bigger than t. So this is 1 minus, the survival probability is the probability that t1 bigger than t they all bigger than t exists by independence, that's just to the nth power of them. Okay? Nth power that. Oh, the t1 bigger than t, plus just t1 or ti. Okay? Just one individual. And i goes from 1 to n. Yeah, well, okay, let's write it this way then. You don't like this one. Okay, so let's do t1 bigger than t. I'll put it this way. First, I'll write it in full. The t and bigger than t. So all of them bigger than t. So the event that the minimum is bigger than t is exactly the event that each one of them is bigger than t. Because they're independent, you just multiply each one. Right. That's the trick. Oh, since they're independent. Right. Right. One minus the probability that t one bigger than t. What's the survival probability for an individual component? That's just the survival probability for an individual component. That's all. Okay. Are we assuming that all the probabilities are the same? That yeah. T because one bigger than t is the same as t two bigger yeah, than t. Yeah. Because we assume that they had each of the probabilities independent. What's the what's the uh, Yes, what's the survival probability of uh, an exponential? It's just uh, b to the n to the n to the Yeah, okay, so then I'll raise that to the n power. Yeah. 1 minus e to the minus lambda n t. Now, is that a good distribution function for t greater than 0? Yes, indeed. It is. At t equal to 0 is 1, and t equal to infinity, excuse me, t equal to 0 is 1 minus 1, which is 0 t equal to infinity, it is 1 minus 0 is 1. So that's a good distribution function. So what does that give you? That gives you that the density function, f of t is f sub t1, the minimum. Okay, so system survival time density function, okay. Lifetime, I should say. Lifetime. I'll just say lifetime. Survival time is a little lifetime density function. This is the derivative of this then. 
use d by dt, 1 minus e to the minus lambda nt, which gives you simply lambda and e to the minus lambda nt. So what's happened is that the, what has happened? What kind of density is that? No, and it's just a fixed number. Well, it is gamma 1. Yeah, it is gamma. It's also uh, exponential. Right. Lambda n. So, so you have. Uh, yeah. It's dying at a higher rate. Okay. It's dying at n times the rate. Mm -hmm. It has an individual component x. Okay. And if you had exponentials, if you had exponentials with different rates, the same argument could be applied. You just get the sum of the rates for the lifetime of the system. In this series case. Well, yeah. Yeah. There's an example of the book exactly that. Oh, that's your homework, actually. One of your homeworks, isn't it? Yeah. I have a question, though. <laughs> I've got a quick question. Why did you say it's n choose one component that dies? Time use the bin use the binomial distribution. Okay. There's another way to approach this thing, because which is. Where, which is the formula in section 3.7. It's some big nasty formula for the density. You want to get into... Well, like, I'm, because when I first did the homework assignment, I didn't read this. I didn't even oh. use these equations. Oh. I started off thinking, if one component dies, only one out of two dies, so don't you use n choose one or n choose whatever use a binomial okay. and calculate through that. Binomial? Okay. that's what I did. Oh, the binomial coefficient. Surely, surely, surely. Yeah. Okay. So here's another way to do it. Um, well, it didn't work out. But I'm just wondering why. Okay. Okay. Here's another approach to this. F direct. Okay, the direct density, f, sub t, f of t dt, okay, should equal the probability that t1, the minimum, is in t to t plus dt. This was the density method, right? Now, is there some way we can actually get that? Okay, you have to choose one of the variables, one of the components to be the one that dies first, okay? How many? Which is, you know, either choose that one to die first, or this one to die first, one of them to die first. How many choices are there? And choose one. To be the one to die first. And choose one. So then that's, so basically you're going to say either I'm going to pick T7 in T to D plus T to T plus DT, and then all the others bigger than T. Okay? All the other T's. T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on. So I can break down this event into a bunch of smaller pieces. And there are n choose one pieces. Okay? And so you basically get f of, you get the uh, e to the minus lambda t, the lambda e to the minus lambda t, because that's the density of the t set. Okay? Okay. Or the event that this is in here is this. And then all the others are bigger than t. That's uh, the survival probability e to the minus lambda t then to the n minus 1. Yeah? Okay. That's it. That's the answer? Because I have n choose 1. Yeah, check it out. She cancel the dt's now. f of t is, put together, you get lambda n e to the minus lambda t, e to the minus n minus 1 lambda t, but now those two together give you e to the minus n lambda t. Okay, so that's an alternative derivation which is the essence of theorem A. That's where I missed. Okay, page 105. That's the essence of theorem A, page 105. That computation I just did. So that's the general case of how you 
figure out the density of any one of these order statistics. You use that idea. The idea is pick one of them to be at t, and the other, either if it's going to be the second order statistic that's going to be at t, then it has to be exactly one of the others that's less than t. And all the others, and all the other n minus 2 is bigger than t. So by appropriate counting, with, a, um, with binomial coefficients, you get this. I showed it in the models. Okay?